Support for this video comes from Skillshare, which offers thousands of inspiring classes for creative and curious people on topics including illustration, design, photography, video, freelancing, and more. In part one, we saw a lot of work being undone and getting the painting back to a virgin state, so to speak. And in this video, we're gonna see it get put back together. And the first thing that I need to do is line this painting. And if we remember from the last episode, I've chosen to do an interleafed lining because I just don't believe that a basic lining with canvas will provide enough support and stability for this otherwise damaged painting. And so that's why I've chosen to interleaf it with a piece of PET film. Onto the hot table it goes. It gets covered with that thinner PET film gets taped down to create an airtight envelope, and then the air will be extracted with the vacuum pump, the heat turned on and applied, and the painting bonded to the new canvas with the interleaf. Now before the painting can get stretched and retouched, there's still a little work to do. The first thing I need to do is address those fill-ins that I did earlier on. While the canvas I use has a really similar weave and weight, it's not exactly the same, and so it's standing proud of the other canvas just a little bit. Now, I could simply leave it alone and build up the fill-in layer to cover up this discrepancy and overfill it, but that's not what I'm going to do by any means. So I'm going to take a scalpel and I'm going to slowly slice off a little bit of this inlay. Not only will it bring it down to level, but it will reduce the intensity of the canvas weave so that it matches the original a little bit better. Now before I can do any retouching or even fill in these areas, I have to prepare those inlays because they're raw canvas. Now I could chance it and just apply the fill-in medium directly to that raw canvas, and the odds are that it would hold, but I want a guaranteed bond. So I'm going to start by applying a gesso medium to those areas of raw canvas, which will guarantee this fill-in medium sticks. Now, I could mix my own fill-in medium every single time I have to fill in a painting's losses, and I used to do that, but now I use an industrial commercial gap filling product, and I do that because the results and the consistency that I get with this product are just so far superior than if I mix it by myself every single time. It's not a matter of cost savings or time savings, it's really just a matter of quality of results. Now here, I could use a very, very small palette knife and just fill in those losses, but that would be a question of time savings because that would take forever. And ultimately, I wanna make sure that every single little spot that I find is filled in. And going over it with a very, very small palette knife doesn't guarantee that I hit every little spot. So I'll overfill any areas that I find, and then I'll come back later and remove all of that excess. I certainly could leave all of that excess fill-in medium on the painting. I could just take a light sandpaper and sand it down smooth and then just overpaint over it, which is kind of what the previous person did when they restored this painting. But that's not how I do it. So I'm going to take a swab and a little solution, and I'm going to start to remove all of this excess material that I applied. I really do want to make sure that only the areas where the paint has been lost are filled in with this putty it's not appropriate for me to leave any excess and then just simply retouch over it. Now, in the past, perhaps on the Aurora video, you've seen that I used a large felt pad that was dampened to go over the entire painting. I could do that here, but I don't have the extent of losses, and so it's not really all that necessary. In addition, I don't have those large areas of losses that require a larger, more even uh, removal process. Now at this point, I'm just going over the painting with a little bit of solvent just to clean up any excess residue. And I could just leave it as is, most of it's gone, but for the next step, I wanna make sure that the painting is completely clean and free of all of that excess residue. Because if I don't, it's gonna get in the way. A simple shop towel 
rubbed over the surface picks up all of the solvent and any of the fill-in medium that was remaining and not picked up by those cotton swabs. In the first part of the video, I simply cut the canvas off of this stretcher, and now it's time to go back and remove all of these tacks and this excess lining canvas. And what I've found is that there are tacks underneath that excess lining canvas, which means the last person who worked on this never removed the tacks in the first place. Now I could simply repeat that practice and just stretch the canvas over all of these old tacks and this excess tacking edge, but that would be incredibly sloppy work and come on, you guys know me better than that. So I'm going to go through and remove all of these tacks and all of this excess canvas. Then I'm going to remove the other tacks that were left by the previous person. I'm going to then disassemble this stretcher and check it out because I think there is a bow that I need to correct. Yep, there it is. Right there. That's going to be a problem and it needs to be resolved. Now, I could simply throw away this stretcher and order a new one, and I'm not sure that my client would care one way or the other. They may very well never know the difference, and if I persuade them strongly enough, they will believe that it is absolutely necessary, when, in fact, it's not. Stretchers are made of wood, and wood is almost infinitely repairable. So by cutting a little piece of wood that matches the curvature of this bow, I can build up this stretcher so that the bow doesn't exist. Now, I could simply ignore this and not do any of this extra work, work that I didn't see when I first saw the painting and examined it. So all of this work is excess, and it's work that I'm not charging the client for. Now, I could charge a client for all of this work, but that's a dishonest practice, and that's not how I run my business. Leaving this bow would create a deformation when the painting is stretched, and it would cause the canvas to ripple and catch the light and become visible. So by addressing this now, I can ensure that when the painting is stretched to this stretcher, it's square, it's even, and we don't have any deflections. It's the little things like this that make a big difference, and if you don't catch them early on, you're left having to overcorrect later on like creating a liner for the frame that compensates for a gap. And that's something that is much harder than simply creating a new lip on the stretcher. I could call my work done and leave this lip as is because I am adding an interleafed canvas, so there is a piece of rigid PET film underneath, so it's not really all that necessary to have a bevel on here, but, of course, at some point in the future, if this painting is ever removed again, somebody's going to take a look at this work that I've done, and my name is attached to it. And so I'm responsible for delivering a high-quality product. Whether or not anybody cares doesn't matter to me. I care. And so I'm putting on a little bit of a bevel here to make this a more finished product and to just ensure that the highest quality of work comes out of my studio. All of this work is done with the hand plane because it's pretty quick and uh, it delivers exactly what I need. And then once I'm done, I can check to see that it is exactly how I want. If any more fine tuning needs to get done, I will do it with the hand plane or chisels. And then once I'm happy, I'll sand it uh, just to make sure that it's nice and smooth, partly just because I don't want to get any splinters. But again, I want to deliver a finished product. And so all of this extra work is now revealed, and we have a nice, straight, square, and level surface onto which we can stretch the painting. We're not going to have a gap there that's going to be visible when it goes back in the frame. This stretcher did have a few random broken keys, as you can see here, and I could just reuse them, but... I don't think that they're going to hold. In fact, they're so broken and deteriorated, I'm almost certain that the minute I tap on them with the hammer, they're going to disintegrate. So I'm going to make some new ones. I'm going to use oak because it's really strong and I have plenty of it left over from a couple of other projects. So I'm going to go ahead and be economic with my materials. 
I could simply cut them off and leave them, but again, I want a finished product, so I'm going to sand them smooth and make sure that they look really good. Who knows if anybody ever is going to look at the back and notice those keys, but again, I will, and a few of you watching may notice. Now before I lay the canvas down on the support and begin stretching it, I've taken some time to square that stretcher up and nail it in place. I could easily skip that step, it takes a little bit of time, and I could trust my technique and my eye to monitor the support to make sure that it doesn't deform, but there's no reason to take that chance. So by nailing the support in place, I can guarantee that it doesn't deform at all during the stretching process. Now, for the stretching of this canvas, I could very easily choose staple. <laughs> no, no, I couldn't. I can't even bring myself to say that. And if I did, I would probably spontaneously combust, and my studio would evaporate, leaving a black hole, not to mention all of the comments that you kind folk would leave. Now with the painting all stretched, I can now deal with this excess canvas. I could simply cut it off and leave it ragged, or I could glue it down to the back of the stretcher, as is common practice. I could use rabbit skin glue, I could use wax resin, but I think that looks incredibly sloppy, and I think it's lazy. And so I'm going to take tacks, and I'm going to make sure that this canvas is folded over nicely, and it's tacked in place evenly. These tacks don't really provide any structural support, but they look nicer, and it's also much easier to remove in the future without creating a big mess. Of course, I'm going to tidy up these corners because, again, I think it looks sloppy if you don't, and I don't want to run the risk that this canvas unravels. This is totally unnecessary, and I could skip it, and it would take less time, but come on, you know me. Now, for this stretcher, because I have an interleafed lining, and this canvas isn't going to be subject to the fluctuations of humidity, expansion, and contraction, I don't actually need these keys. They serve really no purpose. And I could skip this altogether. But that would look unfinished, and it would look sloppy. And so I'm going to take the time to put these keys in, and I'm going to take the time to bind them with fishing line. I could use string here, but string deteriorates over time. I could dip these keys in wax or glue and then tack them into place. And that's a common practice from yesteryear, but again, I think that's sloppy. And also, if I glue these things in place, how removable is that? And now we're ready for retouching. Or I could be, but that would require skipping a crucial step. I could just jump right into retouching this painting, but as you can see, before applying this isolation layer of synthetic resin, the colors are really, really different. And if I go ahead and retouch against those colors, well, there's a pretty good chance that when I do apply the varnish, all that retouching is going to show. So I'm going to apply this synthetic layer of resin to isolate my work from the original, but more importantly, to give me a better perspective on what I'm actually going to be looking at once I've completed all the work and I apply the final varnish. Retouching. Now here I have a couple of different options, not only in the materials that I use, but in the technique and way I approach this problem. I could use oil paint. It was used historically, and sometimes still used today. But oil paint crosslinks and oxidizes and becomes permanent, not to mention it changes color over time. So it's not really an ideal method for retouching. In fact, modern conservators have all but eschewed using it, and I can't count on one finger anybody who still does. Now, I could use watercolor, that's a completely appropriate medium, or gouache, but on this painting I'm not going to get the depth of color that I want with watercolor, and it's not going to stick very well to this resin layer. Some paintings, watercolor is completely appropriate, perhaps where the original paint is sensitive to solvents, uh, and watercolor is the only medium that's available. But in this case, that's not a worry I have to be concerned about. So I'm using a paint that has no oil in it. It has a resin binder. And that means that it will not cross-link and oxidize and become permanent. It can be softened and removed in the future. So all of this work that I'm doing, all of the paint that I'm adding, is non-permanent. If somebody decides they want to take it off for whatever reason, they can do so. Now you can see that as I put the paint on, as it dries, it gets lighter. 
that light color is not the final color. The color, when I apply it and it's wet, is what it will look like when the varnish is finally applied. Now I have to keep that in mind as I'm retouching because if I look back to some of those areas that are lighter, let's say by the mouth, it may cause me to redo those areas with a darker paint. But I've already done them and when the paint was wet and I applied it, it was accurate. Now there's also always a decision to be made about how to apply the retouching paints. There are many different techniques and here I'm using a technique called Mimitec or integrated retouching as opposed to something called Trategio, which is an Italian technique whereby the damage is disguised but not fully integrated back into the image. It's generally a technique that's used in museums in Europe and when there are large areas of loss. Think if this child was missing half of his face or a whole arm, that may be an appropriate technique. But given the fact that I'm using reversible paints and I have an isolation layer, there really isn't much reason to use that technique. It was developed long ago before reversible paints and when retouching was riskier because it wasn't necessarily reversible. So the advent of modern materials have really made that technique one that is, I don't want to say irrelevant, but for most private collectors and even most museums, it's not going to deliver the best results and it's not what anybody wants to see. Now to that end, however, I have to decide how much I'm going to retouch here. You can see that there are lots of little areas of damage, little areas where the canvas is split, where the paint is chipped off or been scuffed or scratched. And I have to make a decision about how many of these I'm going to retouch. I could certainly go through this painting with a fine tooth comb and try to retouch every single uh, visual issue that I see, but that would be exhausting. It would be extremely time consuming and expensive, and it would probably not deliver an end result that looked as natural as leaving some of the wear. And this is an old painting. It is impossible to turn it into a new painting without any wear or age. So what I am doing, however, is going through in, in some areas of the painting, like these figures, which are the central focus, and on the lighter colors where the areas of damage present stronger, I'm going and touching up the ones that become visually problematic for me when I sit back in my chair. Now I take my cues from the scale of the painting. This painting is relatively small, maybe 30 inches by 20 inches. So it's gonna be viewed at maybe three or four feet from the painting. So anything that I see in about three feet or so from the painting that causes me to be distracted, I would consider a candidate for retouching. Now, of course, if I go six inches from the canvas, I will see every little uh, deflection and every little distraction but I'm not supposed to be looking at this painting from six inches away. Conversely, if I move 15, 20 feet away, well, I probably won't see much of anything at all. And again, that would give me a false directive as to choosing how I retouch and what I retouch. So I'm going along and just adding little dots of color where there is loss, where it is distracting to me, and where I think it will be problematic for my client. Now, of course, I had a discussion with my client about what kind of retouching, to what extent, and how they wanted it applied, because this is my client's painting, and even though I may have a perspective on what should and shouldn't be retouched, I work for my client. I can certainly advise them as to what I think is going to be most successful, and I often do that. But at the end of the day, if my client says, retouch every little uh, spot, well, I'm going to have to retouch every little spot. Luckily, most of my clients listen to me, and there's a happy balance that we can arrive upon. And so I've spent about 15 or so minutes retouching just these little areas, and I've got a lot of work left ahead of me. So I'm going to go chill out and do something else, maybe work on another video, and leave you guys here to watch this painting start to come together. There's some clouds that I need to work on that are relatively peaceful, so enjoy.
have some happy little clouds, right? Isn't that what we call them? <laughs> Anyhow, with the retouching all complete, I am ready for the final step in this painting's conservation, and that's varnish application. Now, I could choose a natural resin varnish, but those are vulnerable to aging. Things like damar or shellac or mastic, they change over time. With exposure to oxygen and ultraviolet light, they may turn yellow or brown or gray, and they become harder to remove as time goes on. And so those are imperfect mediums. People still use them because they think that they are the only option and because they don't have familiarity with others. And frankly, I don't see any reason to continue using a fallible material. So I'm using a synthetic resin varnish with a hindered amine light stabilizer, or HALS, which protects it from ultraviolet degradation. Now I could apply this varnish with a very small brush. That would be ridiculous. I could also apply it with a roller, which nobody ever does because that's not how varnish gets applied. I could also apply it with a spray system, and you've seen me do that before. I'm choosing to do a brush technique here because I think that by applying this varnish by brush and then continuing to brush it out as the painting dries, I can achieve a really glittery crystalline effect that's going to look exquisite on this painting. That is, I can kind of mimic what the natural resin varnishes achieve so well without having to compromise and use a material that I don't think is very good. So as the painting dries, as the solvent evaporates, I'm making multiple passes over the painting. And what this allows me to do is to put in a very, very fine texture in that final resin layer so that it's not super smooth. And that helps reflect the light in a more diffuse pattern, which frankly looks great. So with the work all complete, I can go ahead and cut the painting in half. <laughs> no, of course I'm not gonna cut the painting in half. But what I do need to do is start working on the frame. You see, my client purchased an antique frame that looks really good with this painting, but it's just a little bit too big. And without making some modifications, the painting will just fall right through. And that all starts at my shop where I'm going to create a new liner. And that's going to fit inside the existing opening and shrink it down just a little bit so that the painting, well, fits. I'm going to rip down a bevel on the liner and then I'm going to create a rabbit, which is the recess that will hold the painting in place. And this is all relatively easy to do, and there are any number of profiles that one can add onto a liner, and I've chosen a fairly simple bevel because I don't want it to be distracting, and it matches what's already on the frame. So with all of my pieces cut, I can assemble them, glue them, and pin them with small brads, and clamp them with a strap so that they stay square and in place. And then I can leave it for a day or two, let it dry, go do some other things, and then come back and start finishing it. Now the finishing process for the liner all starts with the base coat, and that's going to be a gesso, traditionally prepared, with rabbit skin glue and gilder's white. Now, I could use a primer from the home center, something acrylic or latex, and just paint it on, but it's not going to work for the technique I want, and also, I don't think that that's a great method of doing it, and I really actually enjoy doing this technique. Um, it's allowing me to perfect my technique, and I like the meditative process of preparing this frame liner in a traditional way. Now, I could skip sanding it, but that would be an abject disaster. As anybody who's worked with leaf knows, you have to have a really smooth surface. Now, if you were doing a polished or burnished finish, this surface needs to be absolutely glass smooth. I'm not doing that type of finish, so I have a little bit more leeway. I don't have to sand it down to be glass smooth. I can leave it just regular smooth. Now, I could do a traditional water gilding technique here, but I am opting to use an oil size. And this oil size will be applied to this surface, and it will be allowed to tack up, and then I can apply the leaf. I also could have chosen to apply a red bowl to this gesso layer. But since I'm not burnishing it to reveal any of that red bowl, I don't need it. Once that size has tacked up, I can start the leafing process. Now, I could choose to use real gold leaf, 22, 23 karat gold, but in this case, because I'm going to be applying a patina and toning and tinting this leaf, I've chosen to use Dutch leaf, which is just metal. 
It could be a copper, it could be alloys, it could be aluminum. It's just not pure gold. It comes in larger sheets. It's exponentially easier to work with. It's much more forgiving. Uh, and it takes aggressive finishes just a little bit better than gold because it's a little bit thicker and a little bit more durable. Again, I could have painted this and gone ahead with the toning and tinting process, but I don't think that it's going to look as good, and I want to make sure that this matches the original frame as best as possible. So once that size has had enough time to set up and I know the gilding is well bonded, I can use a soft brush to remove the excess, and I'll save this excess for later. I can use it in other projects. I don't want to waste it. Even though it's not gold, there's no reason to be wasteful. Now there are plenty of ways to finish off applied leaf, and in this case I'm just going to rub it a little bit with a cotton ball to smooth it out and give it a nice even sheen. Now the first time I saw gilding, I was blown away, and I was fortunate enough to learn from a master frame maker who had 50 plus years of experience under his belt. But my guess is that you probably don't have access to that frame maker, and so you don't know where to start. So head over to Skillshare, the online community full of millions of people just like you, scratching the itch to indulge in their creativity, learn and try new things. And if you're like me, and a little taste of gilding has got you looking around the house thinking what else would look better gold, well, the answer is everything. But maybe you just don't know where to begin and are a little intimidated? I'd suggest using Gold Leaf in your artwork by Sandra Bowers. She'll walk you through the basic principles of gilding, some supplies, basic techniques, and how to do any touch-ups if, on the first go-around, it's not perfect. The first 1,000 of my subscribers to click the link in the description will get a two-month free trial of premium membership so you can explore your creativity. So let me guess, you've gilded your cat, your little brother, and your car, right? And they all look much better, huh? So once the gilding has dried, I can now check it against the frame, and you can clearly see that it's not the right color. I have to do some work. Now I could just leave it like this, but that would look terrible, and I actually do have the ability to make it look better. So I'm starting off with some shellac and some dye, and I'm going to mix these up, and once I do, I can apply this first coating to the liner and change the color of that leaf. I need to bring it down from a very yellow green color to a more orange warm color. And so I'm applying this shellac and I will let it dry. If I need to apply successive coats, I can do so to continually change the color. If it needs to be a little bit more red or more brown or even back to green. Now, once that shellac is dry, I'm going to slather it up with a glaze. And this glaze is going to allow me to put that patina onto the gold. So using just a crumpled up shop towel, which will give me a little bit of texture, I'm going to start working the surface. And this is what I suspect was done to create the patina on the frame that I'm trying to match. Now, it's impossible to know for sure how they did it, but as long as the final result is the same or visually close enough that it's not distracting, this will work. So it looks pretty good, but it's still a little too warm. Now I could call it a day and I don't think my client would ever know. Well, maybe if they watched the video, they'd know, but I'm not satisfied there. So I'm going to apply another glaze and this one is a little bit cooler and it's going to bring the warmth down. It's hopefully this will make the liner match the original frame. Now, finally, because this liner is new, I need to make it look a little old. So I'm using rotten stone, which is effectively just dust. And I'm going to apply it all over this liner. And instantly this liner looks like it's been sitting in a basement for a hundred years, which is kind of the effect that I want. It's all over the original frame. And so I want it on this liner. I am going to remove a lot of this rotten stone because I don't want it to be too old. It needs to fit the original. And so now with that liner, into the frame, I can secure it with some Z-clips and hope, hope, hope that all of my measurements were correct. I could easily just use a pneumatic gun here and shoot some brads in to hold it in place. I could use glue, but those are reckless, sloppy, and permanent, and I don't want that to be the case. Even though I doubt that this frame will ever be returned to its other size, I want to make sure that's an option. 
<laughs> now, installing the frame, I could also use nails or glue. You'd be surprised as to how many times that happens. But of course, I'm going to use the same Z clips because they enable the painting to be removed without running the risk of damage. Now, I could just end the video right here and throw up a couple of photos, but I think you folks deserve a little bit better than that. After all, you sat through two long videos to see the end. And here it is. The painting in its frame. Secure. It's not going to fall through. You can see the new liner and how it blends right in with the old. In fact, if I didn't tell you it was there, you probably wouldn't even notice it. The painting's all cleaned. All of the old work has been addressed, been removed. The tears have been stabilized. It's been lined with an interleaf, so it is now impervious to humidity changes. All of the old retouching was removed, and a lot of damage was revealed. The old fill-in came out, it was replaced, the retouching was re-executed with modern reversible materials. And I think that we chose a nice balance, my client and I, between how much retouching we did and how much we left. The painting looks cohesive, the image has come together, and yet it doesn't look brand new. And most importantly, at least from my perspective, the surface is unified and even. We don't see those tears, the bumps, the flaking paint. And the areas of inlay, well, you can't even see them. And had I not done the extra steps of shaving down that canvas and prepping it for the fill-in material, well, you would see those bumps. And even if the color matching was perfect on a raking light, you'd see all the damage. And so my work here is done. All that's left is to get the piece back to my client, get it up on the wall, and get to enjoying it. And really, that's the best reward. So I hope you've enjoyed this process of getting into my head a little bit and understanding why I'm making some of the decisions I make, even if it seems out of order, or there may be another technique that's familiar, choosing what material to use and when, what technique to use and in what order is really crucial. But if all those decisions are made carefully, deliberately, and with sensitivity to the painting, well, then we can almost guarantee spectacular results.